Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on when you're taking time out of your day or afternoon or evening to check in with us. Uh, we're, we're happy to come and, and bring another Let's Talk uh, topic to you guys, uh, one that I think is very relevant at all times of the year, especially during the holidays coming up, though. Uh, I want to introduce to you um, a young man. His name is Matthew Matt Knight. Uh, his beard is much darker than mine, so he he constitutes as a young man, uh, in my view. So um, we are so happy to have him with us today. The experience uh, that he brings, uh, the information that he brings, the expertise that he brings. But I'm just going to uh, let you, Matt, take a moment to introduce yourself to uh, our listeners and viewers, and and you tell them what you want them to know about you, sir. All right. Well, uh, my name is Matt Knight. Um, I'm, I'm in your community. Uh, I live, eat, and play amongst you, uh, just like normal everybody, uh, everyday guy. Um, the one thing that uh, I have a passion for is uh, helping people with substance abuse issues and educating parents, community members on uh, signs and symptoms for the children, the people that are in their lives, and uh, and just trying to help get us out of of, of what we are in as in a community and. The, this is, this is a pandemic that we've been trying to fight for years, and now COVID is kind of overseen that, and uh, we're just trying to keep it relevant and keep it in the, uh, in the, in the mind's eye of everybody that's out there. Um, my day-to-day -day job, I'm the uh, assistant special agent in charge of North Carolina Alcohol Law Enforcement for the Coastal District. Um, I am also the chairman of the subcommittee on uh, substance abuse for the task force on safety schools, and I just received a word last week from my third governor appointment, so I'm very happy about that. I've been doing that since 2013, and I'm also, uh, the, I guess, the ABC chief for Craven County um, and overseeing the ABC stores and security and that, making sure that those uh, people are not being served intoxicated and other age are not in there, able to get alcohol and things of that nature. So, um, a lot in the basket, but uh, my passion is, is education education community members, parents, foster parents, and, uh, and, and students across the state. Matt, we're certainly uh, fortunate to have you um, in our community doing what you do, the passion that you have. Uh, it, it's uh, certainly every, every week I come to work, every day sometimes I learn of so many talented uh, people that live in our community. It's a, we, we have our community college campus and, and we have a lot of shining stars on campus. We have a lot of shining stars in our community, in the professional world, um, you know, just advocating for all the many uh, needs that we have in our community. And, and I was interested how you referred to uh, the substance abuse issue as a pandemic that really had, you know, didn't have the legs that COVID has had, uh, but it certainly still is real relevant uh, in a battle that, that needs to be fought aggressively. Uh, going forward. So um, what I would like to do, Matt, if it's all right, is just kind of launch into um, this is about mental health series and, and, and we'll weave some of those concepts into it. Uh, the, uh, the the question, I, I phrased it, the, the chicken or the egg question, uh, which came first? Uh, and we talk about mental health issues. In your opinion, in your experience, um, do you see predominantly mental health issues uh, under the surface, bubble up, become more severe and acute. Uh, then people find um, substances along the way to kind of treat, self-medicate, if you will, and, and treat some of their mental health issues. And, and then that evolves and escalates into full-blown uh, substance abuse addiction issues. Um, or the other side of the coin is people, you know, wh whatever age, they begin to experiment with, with substances and and, and then they become uh, addicted or abuse them. And then mental health issues uh, are as a result of, of the substance abuse uh, habit that had been started. What's your view or opinion on, on that, chicken or egg? Uh, a little bit of both, but I'm gonna go with uh, the preponderance of it being that uh, people in their circumstances where they are, they may have some type of, 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 of low level underlying uh, mental health um, things that they're struggling with, but I do not believe that that is the majority of the people. Uh, folks don't just get up and say, um, you know, I, I want to be a drug addict. Um, I, 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 
I hate to refer back to this individual as, as, as insight, but there was a gentleman named Andrew Kehoe um, back in the uh, early 1900s who, uh, who, who was a mass murderer. Um, and he was the first school shooting bombing incident that ever happened in the United States. And he was, uh, he was on a school board and he didn't like the taxation that was being there and he got voted out. And so he built bombs into the school that night and he killed a lot of people. And, it's, and I hate to refer to it back to it, but he left something on his fence post when he died. And it's a, it's a sign, it was a small sign that he made. It said, criminals are, are made, not born. And I really, I think about that a lot when I see uh, people that are in circumstances that they, they were, they're made. They weren't born that way. Um, and going back to the new program we discussed earlier before we started, it, um, you know, one of the scenes in this program is going to be a small child who's uh, playing with some toys in, a, in, a, in, the, in the middle of the room. And mom and dad are just going at it behind him. I mean, just, she throws a towel, he's yelling, they're cussing. You know, they're just, they, they almost go to blows, they're pushing each other off, and he just kind of looks up, looks at them, and then goes back to playing. And then it's every day is normal, and it's conditioning. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I, I call it sometimes hereditary crime. When you see something over and over and over by people in your family, it's not so bad. When you look at it, you're like, hmm, well, they've done it their whole life. Why can't I do it? I'm not a bad person for doing this. And it becomes a hereditary thing in their mind where they say, hey, it's not that bad. Um, we also look at um, for the older generation. Um, I see in the, in the early 90s, late 80s or early 90s, you saw um, Darbaset, um, Val, uh, let's see, was it Valium, Darbaset, some of those other fields that were out there. Um, they were just thrown out like candy. No issues, no worries, no problems. And over the years, those things continue to compound and, and people get addicted. I mean, they, they have to have it in their mind. If they don't have it, then, uh, then they can't function. They cannot go through the day. They may not even be in pain, but they can't function unless they have it. And it's, uh, it's a lot of times, it's just the fact that they have to have it. Uh, and it's in the mind. Yeah, the... Uh... It, it, I agree totally with with the chicken and the egg uh, concept of it, it depends. There is no one way. We can't say, well, this is the the uh, first signs and symptoms were started by you know A, B, and C, and then E, D, and F come into play. Um, everybody's an individual. Everybody has their own life experiences, uh, and so sometimes uh, mental health issues um, do uh, find. Uh, as self-medication, you know, whether it's anxiety and when people use alcohol to kind of take the edge off of that anxiety, uh, it's depression uh, and, and they want to feel a little better. We do know that alcohol is definitely not a good, good substance to use when you're already depressed because it's a depressant and it'll just make things worse. Um, but, but people will experiment with different things just to try to feel better. And I, 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 you know, there's a lot of concerns that I have locally with with uh, the way that COVID has affected what's possibly going to be substance abuse. Um, you know, um, my wife works at the hospital with the women and children's division. Uh, they're going to have an influx of, of babies coming in because a lot of people are sending home at home. The same thing happens with the ABC stores. We've seen that, and I, I have to adjust. And we just had an ABC board meeting, and I have to adjust with the money that are spent. There's certain money that have to be spent on law enforcement uh, per law on percentages of alcohol sold. And the percentages are way up. I mean, they are up 25 and 30 percent from the highest year they've ever had. So people are, are, are staying at home and they're drinking a lot more. And uh, I'm worried about the long-term implications of that. And, you know, a lot of folks come to me and they say, tell me about, uh, you know, Kratom or CBD or you know, should I be doing this? Can I do this? Is it going to affect me? Is it going to hurt me? Is it going to test positive? Things of that nature. And they're, they're doing a little bit of insight, and I respect that. Um, it's legal. I'm not going to go into the legalities of it or what, what we should do. Uh, but the problem I've got with that is, is that they're, self, they're self-diagnosing, they're self-dosing, and they're self-medicating. 
And that's just kicking the can down the road. Um, same thing with the alcohol. Uh, there's something there with anxiety. It gets, I mean, a lot of times you get folks that have, a, it's just a, a high blood pressure. Your blood pressure is high, so therefore you feel like you're always on edge. You don't need CBD. You don't need alcohol. You just need blood pressure medication. And so there's, uh, I really wish that people would, would speak to their doctors prior to, uh, to using the legal um, remedies that, that are out there. But the, yeah. There's a lot of things that could be happening in their life that, that are causing that, and uh, uh, taking something is not the way to get out of that. Yeah, who, who, who's your prescribing doctor? Was it the Dr. Jack Daniels? You know, he's... Uh, <laughs> he, 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 he'll prescribe anything for you. You don't have to pay a whole lot. So, um, yep. so it does kind of answer the question, and, and, and we call it comorbid or co-occurring, and oftentimes mental health issues and substance abuse issues run together, and it just complicates it, uh, which takes us maybe, you know, just a, a brief moment to talk about how do the, the co-occurrence of mental health Dealing with mental health issues, dealing with substance abuse, how does that affect treatment? How how does it complicate treatment, and and how does it make the symptoms that much more acute? Specifically, you know, suicidal ideation when you have substance abuse involved. Yeah, it's uh, there's there's a, a gamut of things that go through my mind when 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 people are are, are using and abusing, and I've I've, I've seen it, you know. It, it, even TV and TV shows and movies make fun of it all the time where somebody's supposedly drinking and they reach out to an old ex or they reach out to an old friend or they do something they shouldn't do. And it, it, it's almost made light of uh, because it's so, it's so often that um, it's not only just the fact that they, um, they are doing the substance or they're abusing it, it's that the actions that they do once they've taken the substance are then they're compounding their problems in their lives. And so it's just a repetitive thing on how it's going, and that's why it's, it's so hard for me to uh, to tell parents and, and, and community members about uh, you know, early onset use of alcohol and with with young adults, and then oh, they're in my home, or I, they're you know I'm watching them, they're they're here, they're not out with their friends, they'll be safe, and it's just it's just starting a pattern of of, of giving them an opportunity to self medicate. And with their, their stresses. And, uh, and once they once that pattern is set, uh, it's hard to get out of that. And that's where the addiction starts. Um, I'm, I'm, I've, I haven't had to fight with it too bad, but uh, I, I had a, an addiction to tobacco and nicotine for years, 20 years. And uh, I haven't had any in about six, seven months now. But I, I remember I would go and I'd say, I have to have this. I have to have this. And and I would fight with it. And I'm, as a conscious man, I would get in the car, I would drive to the store, I'd take the, my wallet out, I'd swipe the card, I'd take the, the tobacco, and it, I used this, I didn't smoke, and I'd drive home. I mean, those are all conscious actions that I, that you, at any point I could have stopped. And I knew I needed to stop, but I couldn't. And then I would get home and I'd forget I had it. In my mind, I knew that I needed to go get some, but then when I'd get home, I had it, and I felt better. And I hadn't even I hadn't even put one in, <laughs> so it was uh, I, I had to I had to really start training my mind on is, is it my body or is it my mind, which one needs this. And so uh, that that and I know that's a very far way off from folks that have uh, some severe substance abuse issues, but um, I kind of get it. Uh, uh, on a small level. Well, I, let me tell you, brother. Was it Copenhagen or Skull? What was, what was your brand? Uh, I did greatly, man. I'm 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 a working man. <laughs> you couldn't afford Copenhagen, then? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, I started with group, and then I ended with it. Yes, sir. Uh, I I got started dipping uh, in college. A bunch of buddies, you know, sports and just goofing off. And then carried that addiction for 25 years, and, and it is real. It is real, man. I don't know how many times I tried to quit. I, I've been tobacco free now for probably 12 years, and uh, but man, I, I had to have a dip with me at all times. So I definitely know that. I do. Uh, you know, I looked at it last last Thanksgiving. Uh, I was looking over the meal and all the preparation that had gone into that, and all the food sitting there on the counter, 
And the only thing I could think of was how good the dip was going to be after my bet. And that's when it started clicking in my head, man, you, you got you to back away from this. So. Yes, sir. So, hey, so that's transparency. Hey, the other transparent thing is, what do you got in your cup there, brother? What, what, what's in your cup? This is my new addiction. All right. Dying Mountain Dew. Good deal. Yeah. So, and, and, as we started out, I said good morning. So it is morning. Matt's got Diet Mountain Dew. I've got water. So we're good here. We're we're <laughs> we're, we're good. Um, you you come with so many different skill sets, Matt. And and while we were kind of on that topic of of you know co-occurring substance abuse, mental health, um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with law enforcement? What you see uh, with crime as far as you know. Uh, whether it's uh, robbery, felony, or violent crimes, and then suicide, what what's the 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 play state of play with substance abuse addiction in those crime those types of crimes and or suicide attempts and, and completion of suicide? Uh, there's very little crime that occurs outside of some type of substance abuse. Uh, addiction or reason around it. There's drugs that are involved in 85% of crimes that occur. Um, whether it's driving down the road, DWIs, uh, a wreck because you've been smoking marijuana and you're driving, uh, a kid, you know, found at a park smoking out of a bowl, whether it's a, a residential home burglary, a lot of our burglaries, a lot of our larcenies, break, car break-ins, home break-ins, things that are stolen are stolen to be fenced is what it's called. Or, or pawned or sold to somebody or exchanged for drugs. I mean, that, that is the biggest reason that somebody breaks into a home. It's not to get money. It's not to pay their bills. It's not to do any of that. It's, it's just to con continue that nefarious lifestyle in order to procure something very quickly and very easily in order to get their drugs as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, they don't, it's not that they're horrible people. Deep down inside, they're still good persons. They're still, I try to tell people when you think of, of these individuals that are there, and, 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 and I'll go off just a little bit. When I'm doing the classes, I'll say, what are some of the terms that are used for um, um, people that are on drugs? And you'll hear junkie, crackhead, pothead, doper, you know, all these not derogatory terms that are out there. And in, in reality, we should be saying my mom, my, my brother, my cousin, uh, their name should be Frank and David and Matt and Bill. I mean, that's how they should be referred to, not in the derogatory term, because that's who they are on the inside. And if you'll view them as a small child, as a, as a little four-year-old, five-year-old kid who runs up to his mom's leg and grabs her leg and says, I love you, mommy, that kid's still in there. And that, that person's still in there where they were pure, they were they were kind. They, they had that, that pure of heart where... It didn't matter if you were black, white, Indian, you still wanted to play kickball and, and PE. And we've got to get back to where we see individuals as that, that they're still in there. There's just a lot of things going on in their life. We just got to peel back those layers and help them get out of that, that, that rut they're in because they continue, it's a cyclical thing. It's, I can steal, I can rob, I can do this. And it's quick money, it's quick uh, product and I get to exchange it for drugs. And so that's where a lot of our crime is coming from. And then once once you can't get it, you get dope sick, you can't get into a rehab, everything's gone bad, you've lost everything, that's when it's it's really tough for individuals who are thinking about suicide that when they do get some type of substance, they act on it because they're not in the right state of mind. And it's easier to it's easier to say, okay, well I'm I'm okay with this. It's, that's the very reason that we get uh, the doctor numbs your arm before he does surgery on it. I mean, it's the same concept. It's easier for you to deal with when you know it's it's not going to hurt. In 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 previous previous uh, videos that we've done and, and talked about, you know, depression and, and suicidal ideation being you know certainly one of the most worrisome symptoms of of depression. Uh, and and we, were, we were talking about prevention. And, and so people with substance abuse issues, depression, you know, and say, what can you do about it? Well, definitely do not have firearms in the house. Do not have those dangerous weapons in the house. Stay away from 
the things that when you are inebriated under the influence or whatever, you do not want to be able to get your hands on those types of things because, as you said, the, your judgment is impaired uh, and you're numb to to, to thinking in, in other positive, optimistic ways about what your options are. So, for sure. I, I wanted to continue down the road that you had us on, Matt, if that's all right, uh, just for a moment to talk about. And I know there's maybe some movement even across the nation on this issue, and that is um, really doing some some reform on how we treat people who have substance abuse and addiction issues, and then there's crimes involved, and instead of just throwing them in jail and labeling them as criminals the rest of their life and, and making it difficult for them to come out and, and, and rehabilitate and to, to find uh, employment, you know, and to give them a second shot at life, you know, what, what are some of the things maybe that, that are, are in this reform to, to do more treatment uh, and interventions of that nature that that can maybe, you know, turn turn a positive page on this. Well, uh, anytime anytime that that's brought up, everybody says, "Oh, well, that's well and good, but how are you going to fund it?" And that's what and that's where everybody goes to. It just goes in a big circle. Yes, we want to do that. Yes, we want to help people. Yes, we want to be part of that. How are we going to fund it? Well, it's already funded. And, uh, you know, you talk in our community with Sheriff Hughes, he'll tell you it takes about $55 a day per inmate to, to house them there. There's a lot that can be done with public monies at $55 a day per individual. So I, I'm not saying that we should maybe a collaboration between private sector and government uh, to provide services uh, to where we're, if we're already spending the money for individuals who are cyclical and going in and out of jail, and say, well, this person's been arrested nine times for drug offenses, and they spent, let's say, a total of 430 or 430 days over five years in prison or in jail or in our local facilities. That's a lot of $55 a day when we can spend a fraction of that either through the private sector, through the government sector, or a collaboration of the two, and fund that what's already being spent on the betterment of that individual. You know, whether they take it or not, that's and apply it. Then you know, at least we tried. Um, it's kind of the concept of uh, the guy that's standing outside the store and he says, "Hey, man, you got a couple dollars." Well, my heart is that I need to give that to him. I shouldn't judge him for what he's going to spend it on. That's his heart. My heart is, if I've got it, it's not going to hurt me. I need to give him a couple dollars. Now, what he does with it is up to him. That's his heart, and I can't judge him on that. And that's the concept that I, want, I, would, I would like for people to try to start thinking about is we need to spend the money. We're already spending it on, on, on housing in, in local you know, confinement facilities. Let's, let's spend it on mental health. Let's spend it on a facility where they can go and try to better themselves. And if they take it, then they take it. But that's our heart as a community. That's what we should be doing. We should provide that service. We provide for everything else, housing, food, I mean, Anything and everything you can get for free if you meet certain qualifications. Why is it that uh, it's now not available for people that have substance abuse issues? And it's uh, it's a sign of the times. You know, back in the 80s, when crack cocaine came through, and, I, and this is quite, I mean, I'm very little, but crack cocaine came through, it really, really um, affected the African American community. And people just were like, why would they want to do that? This is horrible. Now heroin's here, and it's affecting mainly the white community. And now it's all of a sudden a, a big problem. We've got to work on this. And, and why? Why is that? Why can't we be a community together and work on it and, as, as individuals and not see each other with all the racial divides that are there, with all the political divides that are there? We're still human beings. And, and we, we've got the, we're the only ones that we've got. We got into this as a community. We're going to, have to get out of it as a community. Absolutely, and I'm I'm glad you're you're out there leading the way and in, in representing. So, um, let's kind of get back to your thought. I want to again pick your mind on so many things. Um, when your opinion on the difference between substance abuse and then when it evolves into addiction, and when you're talking to families, when you're out there dealing with with families and trying to help them. Um, and they, they are telling you, well, well, my son or my daughter or my husband, whoever, these are the behaviors. And when do you say, you know what, those are warning signs. They have crossed a threshold now, 
and, and, and they may be looking at abuse or addiction. Uh, can you just tell us some of the, the, the warning signs that, that, that click your flags when the flags go up that you see and that you try to, to, to inform others that, hey, look, we can't ignore this or you can't ignore this anymore. We, we want to stop enabling at this point because this, we, we've now entered into some pretty dangerous territory. Yeah, I mean, they got to be involved. Uh, there's, I have this, uh, I have this somewhat radical concept that a parent should be involved in the upbringing of their child. <laughs> I know mean, it's kind of out there. They jump them off at school, and it's the teacher's responsibilities or somebody else's. You know, but I, I, mean, I feel they should be involved. And when I say be involved, uh, go through your kids' rooms, <laughs> go through their stuff, go through their sock drawers, go under their bed, go through everything. And that's one of the classes that I teach. Is I set up that bedroom scene. And I teach them the signs and symptoms. And, and not only that, what do you do when you find it? Um, uh, with people that parents that call me, they'll say, hey, I need to, can you come talk to me about this? I, I'm, I'm worried about this. Or I found this. What's going on? Well, I'm not going over there to write the kid a, a citation for the alcohol that they found or the parent found or the, the marijuana or, or pills or whatever it is. It's more of a, of, of a slight intervention of, what, why are you doing this? What made you get to this point? And, and I cannot remember the last time somebody said, well, I just like smoke weed. It's, I'm so stressed with, with school and I've got this going on and I've got, you know, sports and then I'm trying to apply for college and just all these things compounded and, and I, I can't sleep at night. And, you know, it's, it's always something like that. It's a combination of several things that have occurred. So I, I really feel that there's the addiction side, and then there's the mental health side. And the mental health side, when it starts with the mental health side on stressors and anxieties and things that are there, that just segues into the addiction side, where you're just you're trying to find a, a brief remedy using uh, the substance to, well, now I've, I've graduated and I'm continuing on, I continue using that, and then it's much easier to think, oh, well, that's, you know what? That's not going to be too bad. It's kind of like hot sauce. You get a liking for some type of hot sauce, and then when somebody comes up with another one, you're like, hmm, I might try that. And, and, and you know, I'm conditioned enough. So uh, it's, I see that quite a bit uh, with, uh, with young adults, is that they're, they're, they're masking some type of uh, mental health issue, whether it's, it's usually stress and anxiety, hiding. High anxiety. Right. Well, so, what are some of those specific things if you're telling parents, hey, you know, I'm seeing this, like, you know, hey, they, they're spending more time in the room, that, you know, they're not hanging out with their friends as much, or they're sleeping more, or they're more agitated. I mean, what are some of those, those uh, very specific signs and symptoms that we look for? It's every one of them. If you live with a child, you know their symptoms, you know their signs. If they're if they're sitting in there playing video games, I, I understand they're going to be in there for a long time. But if they're just sitting there, if they're sleeping, you can't get them motivated. Things have changed. You have to constantly, uh, you know, ask, 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 ask. Well, that's a teenager sometimes. But then when they, they won't get up or they can't get up or they'll stay all day in the bedroom or they, they need to go out immediately. Hey, all of a sudden I'm up, I'm awake, I need to leave for a little bit, i got to go meet my friend or I forgot I have to do this, and then they come back. And they stay in there another, you know, 12 hours. These are things that you need to be thinking about. Everybody knows that I haven't found a parent who is completely clueless at this point. They all know. They all know because they live with them. But they don't want to think about it. They want to say, oh, it's a phase, or maybe they'll shake it off, or after this test, or this exam, or after this semester, you know, I can just control it, and I can talk to them. They, if they need me, they, they know I'm here. And they just get, it's kind of the, the ostrich with the head in the, in the sand. And uh, I call it, you know, you got to recondition them, their mind on, on how they view that. And one of the questions that I ask in, in the program is, if you go into your child's bedroom and you open up the drawer on beside the nightstand or a drawer and, and or you see something in there, you see a spoon, a syringe, and, uh, you know, a, a large piece of, rubber or something like that for um, um, and a lighter. I mean, that's a bad day. Is there, and I say, is there anything worse than that day when you walk in there and you find all that stuff and you realize my son or daughter is on heroin? 
And, uh, and they're like, no, 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 it's not. And I'm like, actually, that's the best day of your life. The worst day is when you walk in there and the needle's in their arms and they're, they're no, not responsible. You gotta, you gotta view it as if I find this, this is not a problem. I now have, a, I now have an opportunity to save my child. It's the best day of your life. It's the best day of your life because you have an opportunity if you take it to get your child to help, to get those loved ones to help, to help them through that. Get your head out of your rear end. That's what, you know, I, I, I had a lady that uh, she suggested the name of my program when love is not enough because get your head out of your blank is something that a lot of people won't get to put on a flyer or market for them. Um, so that's what they got to do is they got to get their head out of their rear end and say, my child or my loved one is going to die if I don't do something. And, and you know, all these people you know, continue to say that they want to do certain things for the community and I would die for my loved one. Well, dying is easy. Everybody does it. And some people do it. A lot of people do it accidentally. It's when you're willing to live for that individual is, is where the effort is. That's where the true love is. And be willing to not only just die for your, your, your loved one, but we be willing to live for them, live with them, help them through that. Because a lot of people just can't, they're not going to do it on their own. They have to have somebody there. And that's, that goes back to the community event of, of, of helping. And, and the other thing, in, again, whether whether you're a parent and you're looking uh, at your children and, and who they're hanging out with, uh, or if you're a young adult or a middle-aged adult or whatever, there's there's two things that I, I find true, too. One is the, the, the saying, you are what you eat. I say you are who you hang out with, right? Because who you're hanging out with is probably going to dictate your choices and your behaviors. And if you lie down with dogs, you're going to get fleas, right? So, um I tell people, you know, if you're hanging out with, with folks that are that are not doing constructive things, they're doing destructive things, um, and you think that you're going to, you know, somehow not fall into the trap that they fall into, it's just a matter of time. I mean, it's just a matter of time, my opinion. Yeah, and and, and some, I, I had a parent, <coughs> I had a parent come to me and say. You know, this is happening and this is happening and I've called them again and I've done this and they just continue to do it and they, it was with marijuana. And I can't, you know, I'm, I'm taking them to counselors, I'm taking them to this, I'm taking them to the church and they've done all these different things. And I said, you know, you know, I can't figure out why my child, I said, your kid just wants to smoke weed. There's not a mental health issue there. He just really likes smoking weed. Stop enabling. <laughs> Stop giving him money. Take the car. Take the phone. Take everything you can from him. Make it the risk reward balance differently. I mean, sometimes there's not an underlying factor. They just really enjoy doing it, and so you've got to take things away from them. Um, and again, going back with the friends that are there, I tell them too. Sometimes you just got to. They got to get in trouble. They got to get arrested. They got to get a citation. Get them in court. You know, I said, oh, I can't do that. Well, yes, you can. If you talk to them, you get an attorney and you, you you allow law enforcement to do their job, you get an attorney and you say, hey, uh, the judges will always work with somebody, especially the first offenders, and they get them on probation, you get six months or seven months or eight months where they have to pin into a cup and they're accountable to somebody and get them away from those friends and put some sanctions on them. And then work, once that's over, you get a dismissal and work towards an expungement. It's like it never happened. They don't even have to record it when they go to jobs or interviews or any other thing. There's methodologies that are there that's in remedies that you can use, but you can use, I mean, it's not the most optimal way, but sometimes you hit a dead end. When love is not enough, sometimes you need to love your child or, or your loved one a little different. And, and that's where the enforcement side can come in because, I mean, you can't always make them stop. You can't always lead them to water. Sometimes they have to have a four stop. Yeah, I like that uh, analogy because, you know, you got to hit the brakes somewhere along the way. And, and, and if you can't find the brakes within and of, of, of your family and your, your personal resources, then the law enforcement can sometimes be that those brakes that you need to help hit the brakes. So. Yeah, I mean, dude, sometimes you can't you, you speak up, don't do it. You have to have a stop sign. Yeah. So <clears throat> time flies, you know, when we get into these these conversations, we're already about 35 minutes, if you can believe it or not. Um, 
there are a couple more issues uh, I'd like to touch on because there's so many things we could talk about and, and, and so many rabbit holes we could, we could jump down and spend time just really getting into the weeds on things. But uh, we, we like to do a kind of a myth fact type of a, a, a segment as we talk. Um, so I want to throw this at you, see what your thoughts are. People can quit using drugs anytime they want. People who don't stop using drugs are just weak and immoral. Is that a myth? Is that a fact? What are we doing? Uh, it's a fact that they can stop using drugs anytime they want, and that's when they die. That's when they stop. So it's factual that, that yes, you can put a hard stop on it, and that's because you're not here. Um, and then they're not weak-minded individuals. These are these are good people. There's good people do bad things. Bad people do good things. I mean, it's uh, you gotta going back. It's a heart issue. Um, there are weak-minded people, uh, or my as my as my grandfather used to say, the feeble-minded. And uh, so there there are people that are weak like that 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 need strength. They need people to do it, but. There are those folks that are out there too that just are having a hard time, and, and they're not—they're not criminals. They're not bad people. They just need some help. And uh, it, it's amazing how many people hide addiction that you wouldn't know hide addiction. And uh, you know, the people in our community that I encounter, and, and, and it would blow their minds. It blow everybody's mind. And everybody thinks the world of these folks. And so uh, the same thing happens um, drugs and, and opiates and, and uh, I would say any type of opiate is an equal opportunity to destroy it. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, your social class, it does not matter. It will destroy you if you don't get it into your into, uh, into check. So uh, I'd say both of those are myths. In, in the long run, that uh, good people, it, it doesn't matter. So, so it, it, this is not one that I prepped you for, but it, what you just said, um, you know, myth or fact, uh, you can be an alcoholic or or dependent on on some type of substance, and you can still function. You can still uh, be a professional. Oh yeah, I mean, and, and I'm not going to, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to be more forthcoming in it, but yeah, there was a time where I was, I was more dependent on alcohol than I should have been, and it was unhealthy. It, it didn't do good for things for me, and uh, luckily, I, I had some folks that rallied around me and, and gave me a hug and said, hey, bud, you got to slow down, and I did, and it, it was the best thing that could have ever happened. It was clarity, and you know, I met here I am with substance abuse, teaching folks, and, 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 and struggling with my own stuff. So, I mean, it's an equal opportunity to destroy it. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm sure people would say, why would you say that, especially in a public venue? It's because you got to be open. we got to be honest with each other. Um, and, and it's not just something that you, you need to hide. Oh, well, people in the community would know that this is my child is doing this or my husband's doing this. And what would they think at the church? You know, get that out of your head. you got to let it go and move on. Otherwise, you're going to be battling it your whole life. And so the thing of, uh, you're you're the you're the prisoner, and you're the warden. And you're the only one with the key. You've got the keys in your hand, but you keep yourself locked in there, and you can get out at any point in time. And so uh, that mindset of just just use the key and get out. Try something different. Again, the correlation between COVID and and substance abuse and addiction is, uh, as you say, it's an equal opportunity to destroy. It doesn't care. Your economic status, it doesn't care the color of your skin, it doesn't care the level of your education. It can happen to anyone at any given time. Uh, so, 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 so we're all at risk uh, for substance abuse uh, and addiction uh, if it gets out of hand and, and we don't put the check on it and, and really be honest, you know, with ourselves and, and with those around us. So appreciate, appreciate that. Um, so let's take it to to the next level. Somebody says, I agree. I have a problem. I'll go to, I'll go to rehab, uh, Amy Winehouse, you know, that song going to rehab. Um, but, uh, so, so once you go to rehab, you're going to be cured. You come out, you're not going to have any more issues with substance abuse. Myth or fact. All right. uh, uh, myth. And it's very easy, very, very easy to, uh, to dispel that one. Um, whoever's watching this, you think about it. 
how many times have you gone to and say, you know what, it's either through the church or through something else or in, in your relationship, you're like, maybe we should just go to either a counselor or a marriage builder or this, that, and one or the other, or it's usually one of the spouses are like, all right, I'll go. And they go and they sit and they do it and they sit. Do they come back out if they're not fully committed? into a relationship, no. They come back out into the same crap show they were in the whole time they were there. They just went and sat there because they felt like they had to do it. And that's what it's, it's where if you're not committed and you go to rehab, you're just you're just sitting there taking the seat of somebody else that could have been there that really wants it. Um, you got to be at a point where you want to be a better uh, individual. You want to be healthy. You want to live life for, the, for, for why you want to live life. You have to have a reason that you go. Um, and you know, I, I think it's a myth. If, if you go, you're not unless you're committed, and you're not coming out clean forever. You're, you're always an, an addict forever. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's kind of that. It's it's I'm always managing it. Uh, I've never cured it. I'm always managing right. it. That's right, and uh, and that's okay. We're all failed. We're all flawed. We're all broken. And guess what? It's all right. We're human. That's what makes us real. That's right. So it's, it's the last one I want to ask you about as far as myth the fact that the only way to confront an addict is through an intervention. You got to get everybody together. You got to get that elephant in the room, and you got to get that intervention. That's the only way you're going to get through to an addict. Um, no, that's not the only way. Uh, there, there are there. That's a, it's a tool in the toolbox. Um, Again, you've got the risk reward. If you have somebody who d- deeply cares about their family, they deeply care about uh, their children and the, and the life that they have, and they know that they're spinning out of control and they really, really want to be better, uh, interventions are, 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 are not a bad idea for that. For the loved ones that they care so much about to say, I can't do this anymore. If you care about me, then you're going to do this. That that. That sometimes works, but that's not always the case. It's not always the case, and, and so um, that, that's usually what I see with that is, is is the interventions work better with individuals who have like an on-the-job injury, and then they have medication, or they have surgery, and they have medication, and then it spirals out of control. They didn't want it, but it just happened. Um, and the others are, you know, masking other mental health type things. So you've got two different types of, of in my mind, or several different types of, of, of addiction, reasons for addiction. So I guess it would go back to your reason for addiction and how much you care about something. So that would, I usually see interventions work really well for folks that have an injury, they get addicted, but, um, they're very caring about their families and things of that nature and, and, and want to be better for them. You know, that's really the only time I ever see it work. All right. Uh, so, Matt, I want to give you an opportunity because you've um, you've given us some little teasers about some of the uh, initiatives and programs that you've developed and, and continue to nurture and manage along the way. Uh, the, the original uh, get your head out of your you-know-what uh, that, that got uh, – morphed into when love is not enough. If you want to talk a little bit more about that program as well as the, the no empty chairs and then the, the third one that, that you're going to be launching that you talked a little bit about. Um, if you want, tell us a little bit more about those uh, initiatives. Uh, when love is not enough is, a, is a, a program that I do for parents, community members. I do it for foster uh, families and um, I travel the state doing it and uh, until I call it BC before COVID. Um, I was I was traveling, and I, I finally got a trailer. I got my bedroom scene. I got everything donated. Everything was ready to rock and roll, and then trailer sitting there. Um, but uh, I set up a bedroom scene, and I go through and I show, I teach uh, parents about the signs and symptoms of substance abuse. Um, it's funny the signs and symptoms of substance abuse in young adults are are. are so that's typically the same type of behaviors that they they have when they're not on any type of drugs. I mean, it's very it's very hard to distinguish that. So the reason I set <coughs> excuse me, I set the bedroom scene is up because 
you may think, you know, like, no, maybe they're just getting older or maybe they're changing or something. They've got a little income, but you're not sure. So I teach them how to find things in the bedroom, where to look, where they're hidden. Um, and when they do find certain things, what they would look like, what it would be used for. Um, and so they can kind of answer their own questions. They can look for things in the bedroom and, and then not only what to look for, what to do when they find it, have a pathway for them there. Um, and I, I, I bring in our community partners. I don't like the word vendor, but I bring in community partners, which is uh, any type of mental health professionals, uh, substance abuse treatments, uh, youth mentors, uh, churches. I bring in all these different resources that we have in the community, and I have them outside of the, uh, of the program, so you can go and monitor and you can do things. And if somebody comes up to me and says, hey, my niece is, is struggling with this, what should I do? I say, I have somebody right over here who's a subject matter expert on hand. So that way, when they're passionate about wanting to do something, they have somebody that's there that can give them a pathway as opposed to, well, let me give you, you get up with you in a couple of days and I'll have somebody call you. Uh, that, I felt that that worked a little bit better than that. Um, with the youth program, it's called Know It Be Chairs. Um, and it's just an emotional ride of uh, things that have happened in my life. And uh, some of the some of the challenges that I've had due to addictions and, and friends that have um, gone and, and, and lost and, and struggled, and it's just a very open and raw conversation about uh, what could happen uh, if you do this. These are these are these are things that could happen in your life if you do this. I'm telling them at the very beginning. I'm not going to tell you not to do drugs or drink alcohol. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm just going to tell you some of the things that could happen if you decide to do that. If you're old enough to procure alcoholic beverage and find a way to get it into your hands, that's up to you if you're going to drink it. That's just it's, it's, it's a sign of the times when I, I, I can't say, you know, the Nancy Reagan, don't do drugs. You know, that doesn't work. We just got to teach kids what could happen to them. And I've got to the point now where I don't say, don't drink alcohol. I say, if you're going to drink, don't take a pill. If you're at a party and you're friend goes to sleep, don't leave her in the room by herself. <laughs> that's that's where we've gotten as a community. And and it's tough and it's it's a tough it's a tough talk, but uh, I try to give them the opportunity to empower themselves, empower their friend to say, hey, this is my decision. And hopefully they'll make the right one because they think back to, well I do remember that one that one time when that dude was saying this. And they laugh and they cry a little bit in the, in the conversation and they it's, it's they they never see what the program is coming until afterwards. They're like, wow, I'm not, I'm not tooting my own horn, but it really does. It really has an effect. Um, the third one, I have not, um, I haven't even titled it yet. I don't even know what I'm going to call it. And um, I've just started writing and, and, and working through different things, but um, it's it, like I said it's, uh, earlier. It's going to be more of a monologue. It's it's, it's, it's fictional, um, but it's going to be me just talking about stigma that are there. Uh, you can't get the community involved in helping people that they don't know or they don't have an attachment to until they can understand that that's another person as well. Um, people just don't want to get involved because they're like, that's not my problem. That's just some that's just some idiot over there that wants to spend his life in and out of jail, do nothing for the rest of their life, just just a banal society, just a stain. Just go over there and die. That's what they think. And so the 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 whole pretense of it is that I'm gonna take you through a walk of my life. I didn't want to be this way, but this is why I am this way. And I'm gonna have ownership of it, but I'm also gonna say this is why I'm here. And so it goes from young stories of, of, of me as a child and going back and forth to that little scene that I talked about earlier with the child and the fuss and the fighting. There'll be a little video that plays behind me and I'm talking about it. And uh, I'm going to have a little chair or a little table set up with a rose on it and a picture, and that's going to be my mother. And she's gone. And I'm going to be talking to her about it. You know, remember this, Mom? Remember this time when we were doing this? And I'll be talking to her about it. And then I'll talk to the crowd. And I was just going to go through story after story after story about why my life got conditioned the way it was when I did not have control of the way my life was. As a young child and young adult, things that were outside of my control happened, and that conditioned me 
to follow those same type structures as I got older and I actually had control of what I did and I continued that cyclical type thing. And how uh, I'm just trying to humanize humans again, which is really tough because people just, if, they, if, they, if it doesn't affect them, they don't care. It's, it's the recession, depression uh, type of uh, mindset. If, uh, uh, if you lose your job, it's a recession. If I lose my job, it's, it's a depression. It really depends on where you're sitting. And we're all seeing the same movie of life. If you're sitting there and you think of it in a movie theater, we're all watching the same movie. We're all seeing the same thing. But if you get up out of your, if I get up out of my seat and I go sit down in your seat, I'm going to see a whole different movie. And so that's what I'm trying to get people to do is think about, see it through their eyes. Try to take a moment to really think about who this individual is and what they've been through and stop thinking about what they're going to do with their life. Start thinking about what happened in their life and how you can help them. From there, helping a stranger, and that, so that's that's the whole. That's where I'm wanting to go with it on that third one. It's going to take some time there. Absolutely, you know, if if there were one medication that could treat substance abuse or mental health, that would be great. We'd all be taking that that medication. If there was one therapeutic intervention, we would all be practicing that therapeutic intervention. And if there was one great message that we could use to get information and education out there. We would use that, but there's no silver bullet for any of that. And I appreciate you looking at all the different ways, the creative ways uh, to get the message out there. And, and because people relate to different things, right? The, we all have different senses. Some of us are visual, some of us are auditory, some of us are tactile. Uh, and, and you just keep putting the message out there in different ways. And each time, you know, that you throw that net, you're, you're gonna catch some people, you know, as you throw that net. So appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we are. We want to partner with you at any time. You, you when you when you're doing things uh, and, and you need us as wing men and women uh, and wing partners, uh, feel free to reach out to us because uh, we we would certainly you know want to be there uh, in, in whatever messaging you're putting out there, whatever interventions, uh, because we care. We know that uh, our community, the community college, uh, we all. It's like COVID now. You know, we all have a story with COVID. Either we've gotten it or we know somebody who's gotten it. And the level of severity, you know, somebody was hospitalized, somebody died, somebody just had to miss work. Uh, it's the same with cancer. We all have our stories. We know somebody who had cancer and either lost the battle to it, have won the battle to it, but continue. So substance abuse is one of those common denominators that all of us have a connection to it. We have known somebody or ourselves experienced it. It, it affects everyone. It, it affects, there's, you know, the, the six degrees from Kevin Bacon kind of thing. You, right. you're, you're two degrees away from something. Everybody has a nexus to it somehow. We're all affected by it. So, uh, we, we, again, we just got to do it as a community. And uh, I can say that I have not had a better partnership in my 20-some years in law enforcement than I do with Craven Community. So I, I appreciate you guys on that. Um, I work very uh, weekly, if sometimes not daily, with Megan Johnson over there with Adult Enrichment, and uh, she's been a, been a tremendous partner, and uh, a lot of education has happened in our community because of, of Craven Community and College, so I do appreciate you guys and, and all you do and, and continue to do for me in the community. Yes, sir. That's what it's all about, Matt. So, yeah. hey, hey, listen, man, I hope you get through your seasonal allergies there without too many more complications. Uh, hope you and your family stay well. Good luck with your move this weekend, man. Don't pull your back out. Don't injure yourself. Uh, and and I look forward to uh, when we can get back and, and do more things in person, sniffing your hand and giving you a bro hug, whatever, man, and just uh, stay connected. Thanks for the opportunity, and I appreciate everything you're doing. All right. Hey, stay well, Matt. You too, sir.